Anybody else need the words to that song today? No, just me. Cool. All right. Oh, I'm good. Yeah. (laughs) Tosh, me and Tosh, we can hang out. So make that three times that I've cried this weekend. You know, it's never good when you're hitting the Kleenex box before you come up and preach. Maybe it is good, actually. It's overwhelming, though, isn't it? I mean, it's overwhelming to be loved like that and to try to learn to receive that when you know you're not worthy of it. Mm. Well, guys, I'm really uh, excited to dive into uh, today's message because I share, shared with you last uh, last week and kind of been talking about week after week of this series that we're going to get to some practical things um, by the end of this message here. So we're going to try to to dive into some some practical steps in getting our arms around this issue of anger. And I don't know about your personal history with anger, but for me, it was, it's always felt like a very unsafe emotion to express, uh, primarily because as a kid, I was kind of surrounded by people who were um, expressing anger in unhealthy ways. And so I kind of ran from any um, semblance of emotion that gave off this vibe um, of just kind of being out of control. Um, I've had a very hard time knowing how to navigate feelings in general, but anger especially. And I'm sure that um, we're kind of all over the map with that, of how we dealt with, with that issue and expressed it over the course of our life. But I do know that we all have room to grow. And I do know that in, on this issue in particular, that many of us are really desperate for transformation uh, in this area of our life. Because I would venture to guess if you're like me, um, you're fairly embarrassed sometimes at... Um, how you express your anger in in unhealthy ways that kind of shock you um, that that those things are there, that you're capable of acting like that at times. Um, So the big overarching question that we've been asking this series is what did Jesus get angry about and are we getting angry about the same things? We've taken several weeks to explore the gospel stories that, that what kind of aroused the anger in Jesus um, we've examined the topics that seem to get his righteous anger and kind of set that off. And we started, as I talked about earlier today, with, with just the human condition. And as Jesus walked the earth and, and he encountered um, people from town to town, um, he was often overwhelmed um, with just sadness and grief and brokenness for people who were suffering um, from things like diseases and death and just brokenness, um, just the consequences of human sin. Lepers that were marginalized and excluded from society. Um, racism that pushed foreigners um, to the margin as they, they came. Uh, those that had converted to Judaism. We talked about how he flipped the tables of the people that were trying to profit off of those strangers. And disease that led to early death and some of his closest friends. Jesus had been part of the perfect creation way back in the very beginning in the book of Genesis where it's recorded. And so he knew how the world had been created to work. And he knew that what he was seeing and experiencing um, in the flesh was not what he had in mind. To see people denied access to God as a result of human brokenness was a trigger to anger for Jesus. And so over the course of the next few weeks, we looked at some different stories. We looked at stories where Jewish religious leaders elevated rule following over caring for people's actual needs, missing the point of why rules were created to begin with. And Jesus was saddened and and angered at the hardness of heart of people who claimed to represent his father but lacked compassion for human suffering. Many other leaders struggled with self-righteous judgmentalism Uh, Being pretty quick to point out the speck of dust in somebody else's eye, but ignoring the plank in their own. We examined several instances where Jesus grew angry over adults pushing children out of the way. Seeing them as an inconvenience or distraction, instead of how Jesus saw them as actually some of our best teachers of faith and trust in God. Jesus went so far as as to say that um, unless you come to him like a child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And last week, we took a deep dive into the issue of unforgiveness and the anger aroused in Jesus when we refuse to forgive our fellow man, often over a lot of times, some pretty trivial matters. 
when we've been forgiven this massive debt of our human sin condition that we could do nothing about on our own. And the double standard of that perspective was an affront to Jesus. Injustice, denying people access to God, withholding mercy and compassion. These were the core issues that brought up the righteous anger in Jesus, brought those things to the surface. Scripture doesn't tell us not to be angry. It just tells us to be slow to it and to be angry about the right things and at the right people and to do it in a way that doesn't lead to sin. And so those are all challenging things. So I've hope, I hope that we've all kind of taken some inventory on what tends to lead us to anger. I'm most angry, as I shared last week, when my own personal comfort or my desire for control is being challenged. Those are the two things that by and large set me off if I get set off about something. I'll just be honest with you, <clears throat> my blood can boil <laughs> when I'm doing homework with my 10-year-old son and it's taking longer than it should. And I just really want him to go to bed so that I can go to bed and do the things that I want to do. And I mean, if I'm just being brutally honest, I mean, like I'm sitting at the dining room table working with him and I, I got my arm around him on the chair, but that arm, he can't see it sometimes, that it's in a fist. <laughs> and I literally, like, what's going through my head is I want to bang a hole in a wall somewhere. I mean, I'm just, this is your pastor speaking, okay? So what I'm trying to do is just give you a, a window into the fact that, listen, I get it. It's difficult. And, you know, the sad thing is, is that I, as I examine that, if I'm honest, I get way more angry in moments like that than I do about a lot of the injustices that are going on in our world. And those two things are incongruent with the heart of God. It reminds me of the story of Jonah. God commands Jonah in the Old Testament, the story, hopefully you've heard it, he says, I want you to go to this, this group of people in this town called Nineveh, the Ninevites, who are enemies of the Jews, and I want you to, to preach a message. I want you to, re to rebuke them and tell them that kind of, if they don't change, wrath is coming. Well, Jonah doesn't really want to associate with them. and He doesn't want to be called to go do this. And so he runs away and he gets in this ship and he heads in the opposite direction towards Spain, uh, across the Mediterranean. If you can kind of picture a map of the Mediterranean where Israel is and where Spain is, he's going the opposite way. And if you know the story, there's a storm that brews and they figure out that Jonah's the one that's, that's made the gods mad. So they throw him overboard and God sends a whale that swallows him up and he has some time to think in the belly of the whale for a few days. And he kind of repents and says, okay, God, I'll go and, and do what you want me to do. And so the whale spits him out on the shore and he heads to Nineveh and he, and he goes and he tells them, hey, the wrath of God is coming. And much to his chagrin, the people of Nineveh actually repent. And they confess and they dress in sackcloth and ashes and they're, they're mourning their sin. And that makes Jonah even more mad because he doesn't think that they're worth God's compassion and mercy. So I want you to open your Bibles up to Jonah chapter four. It's page 1325 in your pew Bibles. We're gonna read the whole chapter. So right above chapter 4, it says, when God saw how they reacted and that they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. So in chapter 4, it says, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. 
But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said. I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Okay, so if there's ever a biblical text about whether dogs go to heaven, like this is the one right here, right? And the animals, don't forget them, right? But Jonah is more concerned about the shade that the plant is providing him than he is about 120,000 people that don't know the Lord. Maybe we see those inconsistencies in our life too. So I hope we're all kind of starting to ask the question, why doesn't injustice bother me? Why can I hear about things going on in this world that are obviously unjust and it just kind of doesn't stir anything in me the way doing homework with a 10-year-old does or whatever your issue is? So I want to take a minute to look at how Jesus expressed his anger to see what we can learn about his actions and how he avoided sin in the process. And I think it's important for us to begin by looking at who he tended to be angry towards. And honestly, most of the time, it was the church people. The people that should know better. The people that claimed to be representing him. Jesus didn't spend a lot of time being angry with sinners who didn't know the truth about God. He didn't hold those folks to the same standards as those who claim to be representing him in this world. So let's make sure that we're reserving our anger primarily for people in the family of God. Challenging them to love and care for those on the margins who are dear to the Father's heart. It's why I can get so frustrated sometimes about people who who can't get excited about caring for the orphan or the vulnerable. And you know, some of the issues that we've raised up here at Wellspring and over the years, I do want to say, man, just as a, a, a place of encouragement, though, that like so many of you guys have really uh, dove into that, that topic in a lot of different ways, whether it's fostering, adopting, or coming around those folks, or being involved in the neighborhood stuff we've been doing, and feeding kids, and like where we are now compared to 10 or 15 years ago is vastly different because you guys have um, begun to be righteously angry about some of the things that the God cares about. But I say all that knowing that in my own heart, there, while I might really care about some of those things, there are other issues that are important to God that I haven't really grown in that needs to change as well. While Jesus was concerned about injustice, he rarely got mad about the injustices done to him. I want to say that again. While Jesus was concerned about injustice, he rarely got mad about the injustices done to him. Why is that? I'm asking you. Yeah, Dave. Yeah. Yeah, he was just really secure in his identity and who God said he was, that the opinions of people about him didn't rock him, <laughs> um, his confidence or any of that. Yeah. I feel like, like what we read today, in Colossians, just he had that eternal perspective of when I'm in heaven, like, like that's my position. Mm. Yeah, so he, he just saw things through the light of eternity, right? He, he already knew where he was in, in relationship to God, seated at the right hand of God, and he had security in that. 
Yeah. Anything else? Those are great answers. Yeah. I think he also knew that he didn't have much time on this earth. And mm-hmm. he needed to spend more time focusing on, you know, getting the lessons across versus, deal, you know, dealing with the pettiness of, hey, mm. like the, all the comments. And all yeah, stuff. that's a great point. Thank you. Yeah, he just knew that his time was short. He didn't really have time for petty things. Um, he had to stay focused on, on the, bigger, the bigger issues. That's really good. So I want to ask kind of the question is how much of your anger is fueled by feelings that you've been mistreated in some way? How much of your anger is fueled by feelings that you've been mistreated in some way? I mean, I think we all wrestle with that. And that self-centered perspective really misses the heart of God. Another thing that you'll notice is that Jesus' anger was attended by an expression of grief over people's lack of faith. A couple verses I want to take a look at in Mark. It says, then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath? We looked at this story earlier. To do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill, but they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And then he heals the guy, right? But he's, he's grieved over <laughs> the stubbornness of their hearts. In Matthew 23, it says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those that sent you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you are not willing. So you see this just kind of motherly instinct on Jesus of gathering up these people that are rejecting him and being like, oh man, come on. You guys are missing this and it's killing me. (laughs) Jesus didn't feel disdain for people who weren't getting it. His first reaction was to mourn the hardness of their heart and their lack of faith and to probably just really sit down and just pray for them. There was a tenderness at the root of the anger. Jesus' anger had proper control. Proper control. Right? Scripture says that he, he desires mercy over judgment. Not something you see on Twitter very often. <laughs> I, I read this quote this week. It said, Jesus came the first time carrying a cross before he'll come again carrying a sword. Right, the first came, time he came, it's, he came to offer compassion, forgiveness before he'll come in judgment. That's his heart. Paul tells us in Galatians that, that even when we confront someone in sin, a brother or sister in Christ, that we, our heart should be to restore them gently in their relationship, to restore them gently to fellowship. We're never to get vindictive or to write people off. Primarily because I wouldn't want to be treated that way in my worst moments. I would want people to be really gracious and kind towards me when I'm not getting it. (laughs) Jesus' anger had proper duration. He didn't hold grudges and allow bitterness to creep in. Remember, uh, Scripture says, uh, God God says that um, his mercies, my mercies are new every morning. Every morning. And honestly, there for a stretch when things were kind of rough with, <laughs> with our adopted son, like when I would go into his room to wake him up in the morning, I would say that out loud. His mercies are new every morning. <laughs> we're going to have a good day today. We're going to try this again, right? I didn't want to hold on to yesterday's frustration and ruin today and the opportunity for maybe this will be different. <laughs> Maybe I'll be the one that changes. Honestly, it's probably more me that needed to change most of the time. Finally, Jesus' anger led to action. He didn't just spout off opinions or argue with those that he disagreed with. He flipped tables. And he scattered those who were abusing their power. He healed the lame (laughs) And, and, the, and the hurting, the diseased on the Sabbath because he knew, he understood that the, that the law of compassion was greater than the law of rest. And he did something about it. 
He stopped what he was doing, brought a child into the center of the circle, into the spotlight, and made that kid a hero of the faith. And ultimately, his anger over the human sin condition and the separation that caused between God and humanity led him to lay down his life on the cross. So if we are to truly reflect the heart of God in our anger, it must lead to action. We can't just say that we're upset about things. We have to do something. Do the things that Jesus did. Not just grandstanding about ideas and opinions, but actual boots on the ground displays of compassion and care and generosity and mercy. As followers of Christ, we have to be leaders in those things. Does your anger lead you to action on behalf of the people that are dearest to the heart of God? So making sure that we're getting angry about the right things and doing it like Jesus did is absolutely critical. <laughs> but then we also have to examine how we can grow in becoming slow to expressing that anger. So let me take a quick time out here real quickly and kind of ask you a counter question to this. Are there times when we should be quick to anger? And what would be those situations? That would warrant that. What should we be quick to anger about? Yeah. Yeah. Sex trafficking, right? Abuse, neglect, obvious situations of injustice and abuse of power, you know, the vulnerable being used. Right? Those things should elicit an immediate response in us of a righteous anger. Those things are obviously things that are God is opposed to. Proverbs 24.11 says this, Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. Our hearts should be so aligned with God's that when we see obvious injustice that we are quick to respond. Our, our radar ought to be really tuned in to what we know God, his heart is breaks for and, and that would cause him to react in a way to protect those people. And while we're working on getting angry about the right things, we also have these daily battles of relationships that test our anger management. And whether that is in a marriage relationship or parenting or in friendships or work relationships, let's look back at a passage that we read at the very beginning of this series in James 1, 19 and 20. That should, that should say James, sorry. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Just leave that up there for a moment. I feel like the order of this is really important. When we've been hurt and we can feel the anger kind of welling up in us, we should begin by being quick to listen. And part of that discernment process is taking our hurt to trusted advisors. Whether that's a friend, a parent, a, a counselor, a mentor, somebody that we know is going to give us sound biblical advice and not just tell us what we want to hear. We should come to those people and we should ask them questions like this. <laughs> you know, as we tell them the story of how we were offended, we should ask the question, should I be angry about this? <laughs> Is this something that like, or maybe to the level at which I've gotten? And how should I respond to that, that person, that situation? And I think we need to remember what we talked about just a minute ago is that Jesus didn't seem to get angry about the injustices done to him. So that's a really good filter at the front end of, of anger in relationships, right? 
Is this situation in light of eternity something that I should be that upset about? Compared to some other things going on in the world that should really be upsetting me that maybe aren't. And if you saw it in, in, in this, it's this sense of like this picture of like, I've got a limited amount of anger in this lifetime. Is that where I want to be spending it? Or does that better use in these arenas of injustice? So we're quick to listen to trusted advisors, but more importantly, we need to be quick to listen to the Holy Spirit. And David has some great things in the Psalms to say about this. A couple different verses. He says, Tremble and do not sin. When you are on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. What wisdom do you see in those verses? When there's some anger that's welled up in us, <laughs> what are some wise steps that David's trying to give us here? Yes, Jeff. Okay. Yeah, to have a deep attitude of restraint, he said. Mm -hmm. Other things? Nuggets. Yes, Phil. Okay, so he said, you know, a lot of times my first response is to think things through a lens of kind of brokenness. And so that I need to maybe take that pain to a, a non-broken party <laughs> who could maybe speak into that, God, uh, maybe a little bit better than I have the ability to, to see it. Yeah, what else? And I think trust is a big thing too. Because at the, for me at least, at the heart of anger, a lot of the time, it's this disbelief that God is going to provide mm. what I Mm -hmm. really just trusting that God is going to act on my behalf but also give me what I need to really love whoever that person is that may be wrong me. Yeah, yeah. Trusting that God uh, has got the situation that he's going to handle it. That's going to give you the resources that you might need to do whatever he's asking you to do in that situation. Yeah. Um, from a brain science perspective, uh -huh. when we're angry, it helps to be around somebody who's regulated, that mm -hmm. then we can be regulated. So um, it's, it's like a co-regulation of <clears throat> God in a sense, our attachment with him and being in his presence that's peaceful and calm and soothing can help us stay calm and, or get calm. And yeah, yeah. We act out. Mm. We need to be around other people who are, are regulated, right? Um, that's interesting because that, this, this works in a couple different ways. So the things we ought to be angry about, like the righteous anger of injustice, a lot of times it's good to be around other people who are hacked off about those things because that fuels in us this understanding of, oh man, yeah, we need to be upset about this, don't we? <laughs> and then other times, a lot of times maybe when it's more petty things or just things when we've been offended, we need that person who's got a calm head <laughs> who can say, ooh, okay, let's breathe, Right? But I think for me, when I look at this, it's just like, man, there there's, needs to be a moment of just pause, <laughs> right? Don't react. Lay on your bed. Be silent. Allow God to speak in that situation. And for me, a lot of times, it's the shower. <laughs> when I go to bed, I just fall asleep, right? But man, something about water <laughs> just does something, man. I don't know what it is. Literally, like my son, too, when he's had a rough night, it's like, man, if I can just get him in the bathtub, whew, problem solved. I mean, it's literally like he changes. And so, whatever it is for you, 
Uh, keep that up there for a second. I'm sorry, I'm still hammering through that a little bit. Right? Give some room for the Holy Spirit to speak. Search in our own hearts, right? Because sometimes it's like, hey, wait a minute. I'm, I might have something to own here in this situation where I've gotten angry. God, is there some a perspective maybe that I've had that's contributed to this or an attitude in my spirit that needs to be rooted out? Am I to blame for some of this? And creating some space for God to speak into that. But I think it's really important too, that second one says, pour out your hearts to him. So even as you've maybe created some space, I kind of call that filter time. I don't know what, you know, good word is for that, but like, it's kind of a filter between I got mad and I acted. <laughs> that, that it's okay to be honest about how you feel and that you need to be honest about it, even if it's like crazy. Like if there's this anger welled up in me about the situation, just blah, let it out. Talk about it. God's big enough to hear it. If you read scripture, there's some crazy crap in there, man. Like David just like, you know, poke this person's eye out, you know, kill him, you know, just... He wants vindication, you know what I mean? I mean, he comes back around, but he doesn't tiptoe around about what he'd really like to see happen to that other person. But he brings it to God. He doesn't act on it. <laughs> he, he gives room for God to speak into those things. Maybe it gives us some time to think, is the other person that offended me, are they just hurting and just lashing out in pain? Can I have some compassion for the fact that maybe they're just hurting right now? And I just happen to be the one that they're taking it out on. Because I do that to other people. Be honest about our emotions. <laughs> Let God hold our pain so we don't have to inflict it on others. <laughs> now here's the wild card factor <clears throat> that I think a lot of Christians miss in this battle with expressing anger in healthy ways. It's realizing that, that self-control and determination are not enough. Like just kind of white knuckling it and saying, man, I'm just, I'm going to be really slow to anger now. I'm just not going to do that anymore. I'm just going to will myself to be nice. That's not enough. If it was enough, we wouldn't need Jesus, right? Guys, here's the reality is that we all have unhealed wounds in our life that impact our level of an expression of anger. We have landmines under the surface of our heart that people are stepping on and triggering these explosions that we might not even be aware of. And as I've received healing and I've gotten a greater understanding of myself, it's given, me, it's given me a greater compassion for one, for myself, about like understanding why I respond in anger sometimes. I have a better understanding of why I do that. But it also gives me a greater compassion and understanding for others because it's like, you know what, they have a story too. And the people that frustrate me have a reason why they're the way they are as well. And some things that may have happened to them. I'm slower to react. Kind of all those things together that's made me slower to react <laughs> than I used to be. I've gone to counseling. I've done a lot of kind of personality inventories. I've got a trusted group of friends and advisors around me. And it's all kind of conspired to give me a more healthy awareness of my own brokenness. <laughs> Which clues me into the fact that most of the time the person I'm angry with isn't even the issue. And I kind of laugh sometimes when people say, oh man, my, my kid made me so mad today or my, my spouse or my boss or whatever. It's like, they didn't make you angry. <laughs> you chose to be angry. <laughs> But you're probably angry about something else you might not even be aware of and they just kind of did something to poke the bear a little bit. But that angerness was already there. And as we gain more clarity on what those minds are for us and we can name them, 
God kind of gave me this, this imagery <laughs> a few months ago. It's kind of like we've got like a front lawn to our hearts. That people kind of, you know, when they approach our, our home, <laughs> they walk across the lawn to come and knock on the door to get access to our heart. But all of us in this front lawn of our hearts, we have minds buried. And we're not aware of what all of them are and where they all are in our yard. <laughs> And so you see this unsuspecting friend marching towards your door. And it's like, bam, you know, and they're getting exploded and blown up. And I was sorry about that, you know. <laughs> but who we all want to be is that we want to be a person that becomes aware of what the minds are and where they are. So we can help people out as they try to navigate our hearts. And so as I've learned, okay, what are my triggers and what, what tends to get me worked up? And I get some healing on those things. It's like I can go out and put a red flag in the yard where that mine is. And at least I can tell my neighbor, hey, I'm aware that there's a mine there. <laughs> and I'm working on it. All right? It might not be diffused yet. <laughs> but maybe kind of avoid that area of the yard for a little bit. It's kind of a tender place. And hopefully what we can do is as we get enough healing, we can begin kind of removing the mines. So it doesn't become such a tenuous place for people to navigate. But that's work that we have to do to help other people out as well. <clears throat> guys, I think more than anything, I want you guys to know that there are no quick fixes on this slow to anger journey. Okay, I'm 53 and I'm still learning stuff all the time. And probably more so in the last five years than any other time in my life. And some of that is that in our generation, it took us a little bit longer to get around to getting counseling and dealing with some stuff. So I got a lot of hope for the younger generation because I see a lot of you starting to work on things at a younger age, and that's so encouraging. But doing these things in the last few years has helped me to have a greater understanding of why I respond or don't respond emotionally to some different things. And I'm realizing that I needed to be, I should, I should be quicker to anger about some things and slower to anger about some other things, especially just when people personally offend me. And guys, we all need a lot of grace with one another. And I love that when God teaches uh, about love, when Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, the love is passage, I love that the first thing he says about love is love is patient. God is so incredibly patient with us as we learn to love and to be slow to anger. Can we be patient with one another? Can we extend some grace to our friends, our spouse, our children who are all just trying to learn and dealing with their own brokenness at various levels of awareness and healing? Can we have some patience for them? Because God is incredibly patient for me. Guys, we need one another's encouragement. I shared with you guys when I was on sabbatical this past summer, I did some, some counseling in the area of grief. And so I've been meeting with this grief counselor. And I'm continuing to meet with her. But the other day as I was processing some things I've been learning, at one point she just said, you know what? I don't know many people that have done the amount of work that you've done in their life as you have. And I... I don't know whether I completely agree with her or not. I know some people that have done a lot of hard work, but I'll tell you this. <laughs> it was really good to hear and really encouraging. And it made me want to continue being a better man, a godly man that reflects every emotion of Christ with a healthy perspective. And I hope that's your heart too. <laughs> And we saw it today in Jonah chapter 4. But almost every time that you see God describing himself as slow to anger, right after that he'll say, and abounding in love. And the next six weeks we're going to actually pick up that character quality. And we're going to dive deeper into what does it mean that God is slow to anger and abounding in love. And how can we reflect that as well? So I'm excited to learn more with you about that. Before we shut this series down, does anybody have a, a takeaway? What are you going to remember about slow to anger? What's stuck with you? 
What's your one thing from this series? Yeah, Nikki. Instead of being quick to just shut it off, like I'm angry, that's negative, I'm just going to shut it down. Mm. Going a little bit deeper and asking myself, like, or having someone else feel like back to me, like, why do you feel that way? So just not, not you know, being, it's kind of, yes, like just that pause button, but not, I'm not going to do it because that's wrong. It's like, yeah. So just <clears throat> being a little more, just thinking about it a little more deeply. Yeah. So not seeing anger as a wrong emotion but being curious about it, right? That's really good, yeah. Anybody else, what's your, what's your takeaway? Anybody in high school or college want to share? Any young perspectives out there? Watch out, I know a lot of your names, am I calling you? Church ain't just for old folks, right? Yeah. I'm sorry, say that again. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think the quote was something like self, um, self-righteousness um, is a um, defense mechanism for self-loathing. Something like that. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. What else? Anything? Any, any, any age? Open to all generations now? Yes, Aaron. Even you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because we don't know how to do it in a healthy way, right? Yeah. Hmm, that's really good. Yeah. Um, one thing uh, Justin said a couple weeks ago was that when we compare ourselves to others, it requires nothing of ourselves. Uh, but when we judge ourselves against Jesus, we should be humbled. Hmm. Yeah, when we compare ourselves to others, it, what did you say? Uh, it requires nothing of ourselves. It requires nothing of ourselves, yeah. But when we require Jesus, or compare ourselves to Jesus, it requires humility, right? Good stuff, folks. All right. So now I expect you to never be angry again, okay? We've all learned our lesson. Now, let's, let's pray and just, uh, you know, just continue to invite God to help us on this journey. You know, it is a journey, but our progress is directly related to the amount uh, to the desire at which we seek healing. If we're not very serious about healing and inviting the Holy Spirit to come and to change us and transform us, then our progress is going to be pretty slow. The more we cooperate, the more we seek and desire to be like Him, He can do some amazing things in a short amount of time if our hearts are pursuing Him. So let's pray. Heavenly Fathers, we come to the communion table today. God, we just need you. And I think in this journey of, of anger, both of um, learning how to navigate the ways that we let kind of petty things um, rile us up, and also the way that certain things that are super unjust that you get really angry about don't seem to bother us at all. Uh, there's just room for growth all across the spectrum. And God, we need you. We thank you that you came and that you died so that you could live in us, so that you could change us and transform us and give us the power we need to be more like you. And Lord, some of us have just learned some really bad lessons over the course of our life about anger and um, 
God, there's a place for it. You created it for a reason. You expressed it. So help us to channel it and use it for your glory and for your good in this world. And we just come to you, kind of like David said, just um, creating some space to just be silent and and to allow you to speak to us right now. Um, So use this time as we prepare to to come to the table uh, to speak to us.